looking at Voyage. now. Okay. And copy me URL. Also sending to you, Chris, if you want to tweet that. I think it's that one or it's this one. But we're live now, right? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> So hello, um, welcome to the first Planet Hunters live chat in a uh, long while, I think. Um, we've been busy trying to discover planets, as have you, which is good. Um, we thought this would be a suitable time with recent news about Kepler and also the exciting new things that have been added to the site. So uh, for those who haven't joined us before, I'm Chris Lintot. I'm um, PI of the Zooniverse, uh, which is a collection of projects that uh, include Planet Hunters. We are two of the Planet Hunters science team. So we uh, both in Yale, by the look of things. We've got Meg Schwamm, um, who will be from Twitter and blogs and so on, and a uh, new member of the Planet, or newish member of the Planet Hunters team at Tabitha. Uh, so you're going to have to help me, Tabitha, sorry. <laughs> Voyagen. Uh, why don't you both introduce yourself, in fact? Why don't you, this is, seeing as Planet Hunters is exciting, why don't we start by both of you saying what you've been working on in the recent uh, Planet Hunters past? So Meg, why don't you go first? Um, so I guess, you know, in the, in the short term, uh, I've, in the last several, several, several months, coming back to like October and, and November, was uh, working on our, our first confirmed planet, uh, PH1B, and getting that paper um, out and accepted. So um, that is our first confirmed planet in a, a four-star system, and uh, that was found by our volunteers on talk, Robert uh, Gagliano and Kyan Jack. And so I've spent, I think, most of a good portion of last year sort of helping to uh, confirm that planet and uh, uh, write that paper. So recently I've sort of been working on um, looking at uh, other ways we can sort of use planet hunters to, you know, validate and uh, vet the Kepler inventory. And one of those ways is a side project that uh, we're working on, which is using... Um, the Kepler data pipeline, their output. So uh, the transiting planet search algorithm that the Kepler team uses, um, it produces many, many, many upon thousands of these, what they call threshold crossing events. And these are potential transits um, that then the Kepler team spends a very long time vetting to try to make their KOI, this Kepler object of interest, or their planet candidate list. And so a lot of work goes into um, trying to validate and, and sort through this list to find those gems to, to make their candidate list. And with Kepler's extended mission, all this data has been released, and it takes the Kepler team months upon months, and it's a very small team that review these and review um, different uh, criteria to try to vet these. And so we had this idea of why not have our, you know, 250,000 collaborators help us out and do our own review of these and see if we can come up with an independent estimate to compare to both the Kepler sample and they, the list that they've, they've sent out, they haven't finished vetting yet. So, you know, it, it's a really, I think, an interesting comparison and something only that planet hunters can do because there's 18,000 of these transit uh, crossing events, these threshold crossing events. And so it's impossible for one person to look through 18,000 but we can do that with, you know, the hive mind behind Planet Hunters. So um, that's the thing that I'm sort of working on now is, is how we can, we're going through that list. And so um, we have a website up uh, to um, have where you could look at these light curves and see if you see what we think is a transit. And then we can use that to look at you know, the frequencies not only of rocky planets, but everything to giant planets um, and compare that to how the Kepler team is uh, validating their, their candidates. So I think that's really an exciting side project to do with Planet Hunters and, um, right now. And how's the attempt to set the record for the world's longest sentence going? <laughs> Practices, no, no, no that, was, that was excellent. Um, but yeah, we'll, I, I want to come back and talk about the TCE thing um, sh shortly. Now we know everything that you're up to. Um, but, but Tabitha, let me come to you. So how have you found yourself mixed up with Planet Hunters? <laughs> uh, your entire life story in no more than two <laughs> sentences. Well, uh, I came to Yale about six months ago and started working on the Planet Hunters project. And I am interested in not just the planetary science that can come out of it, but also the stellar science. 
um, and eclipsing binaries and variable stars and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> just recently, since I've gotten here, we've been working a lot on um, writing proposals to get follow-up observations to confirm such planets and um, you know, complementary data for, say, like eclipsing binary systems and that type of thing. And so that's what I've mainly been focusing on um, but, in the past few months. So I, I should ask you about the stellar stuff, because I have this bias, because I'm essentially an extra galactic astronomer. I care about galaxies, and we deal with stars when there are a hundred of billions of them at once, and so <laughs> I think we get the impression that stars are pretty simple. But I, one of the, it, it's fair to say, isn't it, that one of the, the results from Kepler uh, already is that things are pretty complicated and the stars themselves vary, they change often in annoyingly unpredictable ways. And the, the, there's a lot more diversity there than certainly I expected. Yeah, you know, that's that's very true and, and you know, sometimes I just, you know, go on to the main classify interface and I just, you know, want to be inspired. I just classify light curves and you, <laughs> not a single one is the same, right? And so, um, yeah, in that sense, you know, we, we know our sun pretty well, um, but even, you know, nearby stars that are close to us, it's still, um, it's still a part of the field that... Uh, is a lot of it is unknown, um, and so we can learn a lot with the uh, with the high precision of the Kepler photometry and such like that. It's um, it it's going to be exciting times, definitely. And so this means that we shouldn't be upset when we see an eclipsing binary, right? Because I think most planet hunters know an oh. eclipsing binary <laughs> as the thing that you think is a, a transit. So you, know, oh, you see right. these big transits and. Uh, and people get upset, but yeah, you know, you're, you're what saying they're, they're saying. actually interesting. Yes, yes, and you know, goes saying, you know, one man's junk is another man's treasure. Um, <laughs> don't be bummed if you see an eclipsing binary if it's contaminated or whatnot, um, because these are very, very useful systems. And we know that planet hunters have found lots of them as well, right, Meg? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, Tabitha has been working on that recently, but yeah, there's a whole bunch that uh, are on then the most recent uh, version of the uh, Kepler eclipsing uh, binary catalog. So tons of these candidates being found on talk. And I think Tabitha can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it seems very exciting. Is there any way to tell from looking at the transit whether it's a planet or whether it's an eclipsing binary? Is there <laughs> yes. any way to get a good guess, right, uh, other than consulting you guys and, and doing lots of follow-up? Well, depth, right? So if it's, it's you know, if you do the... the you know, this the ratio of the radius of the star to the radius of the planet squared is the depth of the transit. So, um, you know, if it's two <laughs> Jupiter radii or higher, I'd be suspicious already. Or if you see a secondary eclipse, it's usually a pretty good sig signature that that's uh, some kind of eclipsing binary right there. Yep. Otherwise, okay. no. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to go I mean, through people, all don't the people talk about the shape of the transit. Um, you know, people talk about V shape. I mean, we don't ask this question because we know it's right. not reliable. But I swear I've heard people tell me that I should look at the difference between, you know, V-shaped transits and, and nice, you know, sort of U-shaped ones, and that people talk. Well, suggest that the difference. <laughs> also depends yeah. on if your uh, impact angle. So what angle you're coming in on the star, and so you can get that kind of V-shaped if you're very, very, like, have a very high inclination orbit. So yes, the V shape can <laughs> suggest it's eclipsing binary, but even the Kepler team doesn't quite use that as a way to rule it out because we don't know what the inclination of their orbit is. We have to fit for that in one of the parameters. Most of the time for most transits around a star, um, most of those, those inclinations will get you things that have more of a U shape, but some of them will give you, a graze, very grazing will give you V. So yes, uh, you get more of that V shape because both stars have have limb darkening, so you're darker on the outsides and brighter on the inside, and so that gives you that V shape, but a planet could, pro transit could produce something like that, but yeah, that's another in in an indication that you might be a little worried about what you're seeing might not be a planet. Okay, well let's let's talk about, so so we're talking about different types of candidates, so let's let's just go back to talking about the, the TCE interface that you were talking about, so this, in, in your introduction to yourself. So this is a separate part of the site. So, so let's give people the URL before we do anything else. So, so where do we find this thing? Sure. It's linked from the blog <laughs> is the answer, right? Yes, but it's, I actually know it. 
It is tcereview.planethunters.org. Okay, and then what I, I think you sort of touched on this earlier, but how does a star end up on the, that list there? So that is the transiting planet search algorithm. So the automated routines that the Kepler team uses has picked up and, and, and flagged that they, it thinks that there's a transit there, a repeating transit. Um, and so it going through uh, almost three years worth of data, is it three years, I believe, uh, three years worth of data says, I think there's a repeating signal that looks like a transit that looks like this with this orbit with this size planet. Okay, and so why is that not a detection? Why do we need to, to look at them? Because it flags a lot of things. To be cautious, you want to find planets. So it, it, it flags on a lot of things that may not necessarily be real, other false positives, other things that might look periodic when you sort of fold in a line, a light curve on the, on the orbital period or some repeating pattern that might look kind of look like a transit. And also it does some, some trying to denoise the light curves, and so combining that all together, you will get some things that might be false positives. Um, and so there, you know, to give a rough example, the last time that the Kepler team ran this, they had over, you know, 7,000 or 10,000 uh, tr possible transit candidates, and it turned out to be a little less than 3,000 planet candidates that came out of that. So you can just sort of see how many sort of detections there are versus how many real things that we think are transits or likely to be transits that came out of that, come out of that pipeline. So you, that's for the first few years of Kepler data, and we haven't really talked about the, the elephant in the room at, at this point, which is the sad news that we got, what, last uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, so just, just, just under a week ago, which is that um, Kepler's having some pretty serious problems. So um, I don't know which of you wants to answer this, but could, can we talk about what's happening with the Kepler spacecraft right now? And we'll come on to what it means for Planet Hunters in a second, but, but, but what exactly is the situation with Kepler? I can take that if you like. Um, sure. So Kepler requires very, very good precision pointing to do its measurements and millipixels. So, <laughs> you know, sitting there and basically staying on the same point of its imager to get the beautiful, exquisite light curves that we see. And it's being buffeted by the solar wind and torques from the sun. And uh, the way it keeps it aligned are these reaction wheels. And it needs three re reaction wheels because you've got three directions to keep you at this fine precision. And Kepler has thrusters, but the thrusters are not able to give you that fine precision. It's basically used to give you sort of gross motion and um, you know, rotate towards the Earth and realign its, its solar panels with the sun. So Kepler was built with four wheels, so one spare, and um, last July, reaction wheel two um, had a high torque event, so meaning it was requiring more and more power to sort of power it, and then it just failed and would not rotate very quickly or well, not enough to point, um, even sort of uh, force NASA, you know, sending the commands for it to go full force. Um, and so they were down to three wheels at that point last July to point the minimum that they need. And reaction wheel four, um, at that time, it started to sort of started to behave sort of, it, I guess it always been a little wonky, but it had always sort of been acting up as sort of the problem child. Um, and so there was this concern that reaction wheel four may be wearing the same way that reaction wheel two is. They think at this point it's metal grinding on metal on these reaction wheels. Um, and so uh, last week, uh, Kepler was in a safe mode. It, they found it sort of rotating, trying to contact Earth to say it had stopped pointing and there was some kind of glitch. And it was that reaction wheel four had stopped moving. And when they commanded it back to full force, it refused to rotate. So without three uh, running reaction wheels, um, Kepler can't do the exoplanet science that we all know and love it for. Um, so, but... Kepler team just announced, like this just happened and the Kepler team announced it, so they haven't called the end of the mission yet because NASA engineers, you know, need some time to see if they can work their magic, but it doesn't, it, it right now, um, at least, unless they can get one of the two reaction wheels that have failed back online, um, Kepler may not ever come back to be doing its uh, exoplanet science. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for planet hunters? Well, it means no new data in terms of, you know, past uh, 
you know, um, you know, observations from Kepler past, you know, um, a week ago. But I think we, as um, I think, sort of Bill Baruki um, was passionately saying in this press conference. He's the PI of Kepler. <laughs> yeah, he's PI of Kepler, and he's what, spent 20, 20 years of his life, to, uh, you know, pushing for Kepler, and you know, from you know, it being rejected and, and in proposal stages and continuing to push forward in tech development. This is his brainchild and baby and, you know, kudos to him for all that he's done to get Kepler launched and its beautiful science. And passionately said that, like, there's so much data that's already been taken from Kepler that even if we didn't get any more light curves tomorrow, um, there's, I think, a year, year and a half, so almost two years worth of data that really hasn't been looked for for planets, even by the Kepler team. And so... Um, with the, the community and planet hunters, there are going to be so many more discoveries coming from Kepler that, you know, although we're sad not to be getting any longer baselines and longer period planets, there'll be so much more science coming out of, uh, out of this data set, um, and we will be able to understand the frequency of, of uh, Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars, which is its primary mission. So, um, so Tab Tabitha, I think people, I mean... What Meg said is reassuring because it's good to mm -hmm. know there's more light curves to plant hunters. But um, people would be surprised that there's so much data that hasn't been sorted, I think. You know, it feels quite strange. We go to all this effort to put a satellite in space, and my God, did they put a lot of effort into it. Um, and yet it, it feels slightly odd to talk about the data piling up here on Earth. So maybe you could say something about the, the amount of effort it takes to get through the Kepler data and the follow-up that needs to be done. Maybe you, if you could give us some sense of why there's still this backlog, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess simply saying it's a lot of data to sort through is... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, that's the first uh, part. Easily right, put, but, but um, I mean, you have... I, I guess what I'm getting at is the people get... Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, you have billions and billions of data points. Like, you have every star that's been looked at for, like, three and a half, um, you know, four years, four years. Um, continuously, like, every 30 minutes, you have, you know, a new observation of this star for four years, every 30 minutes. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a huge amount of data. And, um, and just simply that is completely overwhelming for um, even, you know, computer algorithms to you know, search through these light curves and, you know, planet hunters as well. Um, yeah, but, you said, uh, as you pointed out earlier, the stars are complicated beasts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so Meg, what, what, what data is up at the minute on planet hunters? Uh, um, what, what, what are we looking at right now? Where are we in this? We've got four years' worth of data, so where have we, where have we got to? Well, we've jumped. So we were looking at quarter seven, and then all this data has been released, and particularly with Kepler's extended mission, the data started being released as it was downloaded from the spacecraft and processed and then released to everybody, the Kepler team, plant hunters, the community, everybody at the same time. So we jumped to quarter 14, which was um, the latest quarter released earlier this year, which is brand new data that hadn't been looked at, basically even the Kepler team hadn't looked at yet. Um, and so we're doing that quarter right now. There's quarter 15, which is came down from the Kepler a uh, month or two ago and is being processed. It takes about three to four months for the Kepler data processing pipelines to take the raw light curves and make them into the, the reduced light curves that we show on the, on the website and get released to the community. And then there's also like another month and a half worth of uh, Kepler data before the, this um, reaction wheel failure. So in terms of new data that coming off the spacecraft, there's still more that data to come, plus from seven to, you know, four, thirteen that we have, you know, eight to thirteen that we haven't even looked through. We haven't found everything that's in the ones we've been looking through. I mean, hence the TCA review and so on. Exactly, um, and also I think is uh, an interesting thing is, and I think will, might be a, a, a something that Planet Earth will be very strong in, is that if we don't get, you know, if Kepler doesn't come back. Um, we're not going to get these long pace lines that we were hoping to get with the extended mission. So really finding, you know, things that are like Jupiter analog. So Jupiter is sitting, Jupiter-sized things sitting at 5 AU. There might only be one transit in the entire Kepler data set. And that's something I think will be hard for automated routines looking for repeat patterns, but something that planet hunters, our volunteers will be able to spot. And that's something we haven't even sort of um, started to look at yet because there's been so much Kepler data and so many classifications to keep us busy on, on other things, on shorter periods. 
So I think there's lots of things that we can find in, in the Kepler data set. We've just scratched the surface. So, so at this point, we've got a couple of questions on Twitter. Uh, you can tweet us at Planet Hunters uh, if you want to add to their number. Um, but you can do that even if you're not watching this live, by the way. So people of the future, you can still communicate with us via Twitter at Planet Hunters um, or uh, I'm at Chris Edot, and you can find Meg as well. Uh, we've got a question from AJEB son or a jebson a jebson i suspect um who has a couple of questions so so uh tabitha a a jebson would like to you talked about briefly at the beginning about applying for uh time to follow up on discoveries so the questions about um how that's going and and really about what we're asking for um and there's a specific question about whether harps n is useful which, which um, a. Jebson clearly knows is an instrument, but maybe it would be worth talking about what HARPS is and what it does for us. Okay, um, well, <clears throat> we went through a, a couple of different avenues for follow-up observations. Uh, one was using the WIN telescope at Kitt Peak, which has an instrument called Hydra on it, and it's a multi-object spectrograph, and so it just takes the light from the stars and um, puts it into a fiber and then spreads it out and you can see all the spectral lines from the different elements in there. And um, this, the purpose of this proposal was mainly to look at binary stars, so we're going to measure the radio velocity, so the Doppler shifts of the lines over time, and to characterize uh, hundreds of eclipsing binaries in the Kepler field. Um, that proposal was awarded time, it was awarded five nights in the fall. I'm not sure when they are yet. Um, and we're going to try and spread that over half nights as well so we can kind of um, double the time in a sense. Um, you know, Wynne has just been doing Galaxy Zoo science this week. So it's a oh. much beloved telescope for Zooniverse. So this is good. Excellent, excellent. And um, I actually got an email last week from uh, another group here at Yale that I think they do galaxies or s something of the sort. It doesn't really matter, but they couldn't make it to their observing run, and they asked us if we could, and they cool. could, and we can observe our Kepler objects well, and for half of the night, and the other half of the night observe their stars, and so that would mean another, I think, three or four nights in July. Nice. Pretty awesome. And I love the fact this is the dark side of ast astronomy. This is the horse trading <laughs> of secret telescope time. <laughs> yeah. Even the Galaxy, and, and the Galaxy Zoo cookies. team resorted to asking on Twitter for objects to look at. So you're clearly doing better than that. <laughs> so, um, yes, and cookies came along with that. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, uh, another one we haven't heard from yet was a really big proposal for um, a Kepler key science um, observing with the Keck telescopes. And so what that is is a proposal for uh, two years of observing time with uh, the Keck 1 and the Keck 2 telescopes. The Keck 1 telescope has a high resolution spectrograph um, and the Keck 2 telescope has a, a, a an adaptive optics imager, and um, and those were to use for a planet uh, confirmation, like the validation of the planets and characterization of the host stars. Um, still haven't heard from that, but fingers crossed. The proposal is awesome, <laughs> um, so they have to do it. Um, and uh, and we really highlighted in that proposal that a lot of the stars or a lot of the planet candidates that planet hunters have found have been missed by the computer algorithms. Um, there's been several papers published so far on this and uh, even recently um, G. Wang, who's another postdoc here at Yale, he, he published a paper on, he submitted a paper, it's, it's not accepted yet, we're waiting on some additional data, uh, but he uh, he had 43 planet candidates, and while he was writing the paper, we knew the Kepler team was going to you know release some like you know big list of something. We didn't know what it was, and uh, and so we were like hurrying, hurrying, hurrying to do it. And then they released their list, and it wasn't a candidate list, but it was actually the TCE list that Meg was talking about before. Right. And um, and so we used that to see, okay, well, you know, when can you get a, a TCE detection? Has Planet Hunters detected all the 
planets in the TCE list, or or vice versa, right? You know, are all the planet candidates that like G had in his paper in the TCE list? And surprisingly, uh, there was I think you know, 17 percent of them were not and should have been. And so, right. Planet Hunters really has like a a special niche in in detecting you know longer period planets planets around more active stars just because you know it's it's harder to pick out these um, repeated signals and stars are complicated which is my theme for this, yeah. this thing <laughs> out, I think um, speak, speaking of proposals as you um, as you all have been hearing astronomers spend forever writing proposals and I need to go and talk to somebody about a grant that we hope we'll get which will fund the universe so I'm going to duck out but thanks for chatting both of you and I will leave you the audience in the very capable hands of our planet hunters. <laughs> Good luck with that Chris. So I guess as we could take a few more questions and then sort of uh, um, wrap up. Uh, Tabitha do you want to talk a little bit about Harps North? Um, I can talk about what I know about it. <laughs> um, I believe the Harps North program is run by the folks up in Boston, I think at CFA, um, which is Harvard. Yes, Harvard Center for Astrophysics. And they are doing exoplanet follow-up on, um, on Kepler stars. Uh, as well as their own exoplanet searches um, targeting, I think, nearby stars as well. Um, so I think they came online last year sometime, and so uh, they are operational, but I think, it's, I think it's completely private. I'm not sure. Do you know? Um, so it, it's the joint, it's European, it's the people that run HARP South, which is known for having very good radio um, Right, it's an exact clone so, of the Harp South. Uh, almost. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's some tweaks that I think Harp South, the improvement that Harp North doesn't quite have yet. But yeah, it's basically sort of the same thing. Um, and uh, the problem is, is that Harp South can't reach um, most of the Kepler field because mm -hmm. the Kepler field is actually in the northern part of the sky. So um, the Harp uh, telescope can only get sort of the last sort of southern edge of it. Um, but HARPS has a better precision than the, the spectrograph on Keck that we use to validate planet hunters, catenates, and that um, most of the uh, U.S. astronomers actually use to validate uh, Kepler candidates. And so um, HARPS North, now having a clone of HARPS in the north, I believe it's in the Canaries, um, mm -hmm. one of the, the telescopes there. And um, you can get down to several sort of... Uh, um, it's pushing into the set uh, into the centimeter per second resolution, which is what you really need to see in the wobble due to an Earth plant like uh, planet around or Earth sized planet around a Earth mass around a, a, a sun like star. Um, mm -hmm. So it gets into the one meter, you know, half a centimeter, half you know, half a meter per second resolution for really really bright stars. So with Kep with Kepler candidates, the hope is that all these things that are about two Earth radii, two point five Earth radii. Harps North should hopefully help us put constraints to be able to uh, constrain their mass better and maybe sort of rule out um, whether they're water worlds or maybe mini Neptunes. Um, and so one of these, these sort of questions we have is whether are, if you're two Earth radii or 2.5 Earth radii, are you like a mini Neptune and kind of a puffy atmosphere or are you kind of like a super Earth with maybe a completely water world? And so um, Kepler 22b, which is... Um, so, uh, the first sort of planet discovered in the habitable zone that was uh, possibly rocky um, around a sun-like star. Uh, with Harps North, there's a possibility, and that, a good possibility, that they'll actually be able to rule out the super Earth or the mini Neptune um, uh, likelihood with with uh, Harps uh, radial velocities. So um, I think Harps is going to be an interesting uh, player for helping us try to confirm uh, Kepler planet candidates. Um, but as you said, it's very private, so most of the U.S. astronomers don't have access to it, um, mainly European or uh, collaborators at, at Harvard. Um, I guess one thing we haven't talked about is TESS, which was sort of the, the news that came out recently. Um, and I guess particularly with sort of Kepler and us talking about Kepler's legacy, do you want to have the talk a little bit about uh, what uh, 
sort of Tess is and, and what, you know, uh, that might mean for Planet Hunters? Um, the details of Tess I'm, I'm not really uh, familiar with, but um, the, the idea of it is it's, um, it's going to be, uh, uh, wait, let me see, it stands for the Transiting Exoplanet um, Survey. Is that right? Survey satellite. I, <laughs> I don't know either. I think it's. I think you're right. It's called okay. TESS. <laughs> you, can look called up the TESS. you can look um, up the acronym later. <laughs> what is what is what it's going to do is it's going to monitor a whole bunch of really, really bright stars. I think brighter than twelfth uh, magnitude in the sky um, for transits. And so instead of just looking at a single field of view in the sky, it's going to do an all sky survey. Um, it obviously can't look at the whole sky for um, continuously for the duration of its lifetime. So it's it's going to look for more shorter period planets, focusing on each field for I think maybe three three months or so, plus or minus a month. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the the key with tests is that. Um, it, since it's looking at brighter stars, follow-up observations to confirm these planets, these transiting signals around these stars, is going to be a whole lot easier. Um, and I don't know, Meg, if you want to fill in on the rest of it, I'm I'm well, pretty excited about it. I think sorry. planet hunters can definitely uh, do the same kind of science that they are doing with Kepler um, with TESS as well. Um, yeah, I, I hope we'll be, we'll be able to get light curves um, from Tess on there. I know they're calling it the People's Telescope, so I think they're going to have a, a, a data release policy, pro some, you know, in some ways similar to sort of the Kepler accepted mission. So I think there'll be lots of data, um, but I don't think anyone knows what's exactly what's going to happen. But I think I would love to see um, uh, test data one day on the Planet Hunters website. It's going to launch in 2018, so we've got a bit. But I think what's really cool about tests and its discoveries and hopefully ones that planet hunters will make with test data, um, fingers crossed on that, is that um, because these are all bright stars, as, as Tabitha, you mentioned, we'll be able to get radial velocities because they're much, much brighter. So most of Kepler stars are very faint and, you know, ground-based uh, radial velocity techniques are just not, don't have the sensitivity to confirm these planets and get their masses. But with tests, if you're looking over the whole sky, basically because we know from Kepler that planets are everywhere, um, you can look at the brightest stars across the whole sky, get a sample, get their masses from radial velocities, and you're getting their, their radii from transit. So now we get into densities. So now we get into bulk compositions, and that's really cool to start saying, like, what are these planets made of? Um, and so that's sort of, I think, a, a, you know, seeing what Kepler's done and where TESS is now going to take us. And so I think that's sort of a, a really cool thing to see that, you know, because we know planets are everywhere, you know, that's why we can do tests and just look at the bright stars. Mm -hmm. And so let's see if there's any more questions from Twitter. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, Twess, uh, Tony Jebson <laughs> has told us it is a transiting exoplanet survey satellite, and it's MAG4212. <laughs> Thank you, Twitter, <laughs> for getting us the details that we don't have off the top of our fingertips. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so I guess um, we could sort of start summing up, but, um, you know, what I guess are the things that you're hoping to do with Planet Hunter sort of in the next few months? or the next year, so what do you think we'll, we'll be talking about the next time we have a, a live chat? Um. Oh, is that a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> no, what, um, what I think is pretty awesome about Planet Hunters is that you can't really, you know, or, or what's awesome about science is that you never really know what you're going to find, right? Because it's all new stuff, like, yeah, you can you can predict things based on like what you know but and what you're looking for um, so I can say oh yeah we're gonna find you know a hundred new planets and uh, then we're gonna validate them da, 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 da. Uh, but um but you know that's that's kind of obvious you know everybody's shooting for this like main goal but I'm really excited for the unknown I guess you know like what we can find in the data that's just, you know, we haven't thought about yet. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of those discoveries are coming from talk. So um, I think that's really exciting that uh, a lot of the volunteers are sort of being brought into this um, through talk and that they're, uh, we're trying to keep up with them. <laughs> Absolutely, um, yeah. So I guess we'll say, is, <laughs> you know, in six months our prediction will be completely would be completely changed, and I think that's sort of the, the sort of the theme. I think last year, to this time, we would have never thought. I would have never thought we'd have a plan in the four-star system, um, and hopefully by then we'll also have uh, confirmed PH two B. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we are, you know, finding more and more planets and more and more strange things. Um, and I also uh, hope to learn more about all the sort of stellar astrophysics um, that is now going to be coming out of the Planet Hunters data. So. I think, you know, unless you want to just sum up in a sentence or two, give final remarks, we can wrap this up. Well, I just want to thank our users um, for participating and listening today. Yeah, thanks, guys. And um, more clicks. Help us look through more of the Kepler data. So you can go to planethunters.org. Or, you know, if you want to help out with the TC review, it's tcereview.planethunters.org. Planethunters.org. We'll put links to the main classification interface and to the TC review. So thanks very much for all of your clicks, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Bye.